purposes of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And then reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. speak to you this afternoon. I was asked to bring some words of encouragement on behalf of Pastor Henry and Miss Martha. I believe these words will be encouragement for us because I believe the Father has already encouraged Pastor Henry as he walked through the gates. Three things that dropped inside of me when uh, I was asked to talk actually before that when I was standing in the hospital room and, and talking to Martha. The first is hope. First Thessalonians, I'm just going to read you a couple of scriptures. Pastor Gene read a few, so if you get wore out, it'll be all right. You have the rest of the afternoon for a break. <laughs> First Thessalonians chapter 4, 13, it says, We don't want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, concerning those who are asleep, so you'll not grieve like the rest who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose in the same way, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. Yes. Those of us here today, that Jesus is Lord and Savior of your life, we know that though it's hard to say goodbye, uh, many of us have had to do it many times in our life, and this is just one more, but we know that we're not saying goodbye, we're only saying till we see you later. Amen. Right. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. And I believe that Pastor Henry lived his life that way, knowing because he had this living hope that those who have gone before him, he would see them once again, even now. The next is endurance. Pastor Henry and Miss Martha, it, uh, she's still here to hold the standard. Something as I, uh, I guess I'm gaining as I get older is an appreciation for those who are unwilling to yield to what's easy. Mm. And Pastor Henry and, and Martha, I remember back in 2014 when first time you went to the hospital we just had a flood at the church and it was a crazy time and I remember the prognosis was not good then it never is with the doctors right mm. uh, but I remember something that they both said Miss Martha said I don't want anybody in this room that doesn't speak faith over my husband right. I don't want anybody that doesn't believe for God's best you know when we live our lives that way as Pastor Henry did talks about 2 uh, Timothy 4. Paul said it this way, and I believe these are the same words that we could use today or fitting. It says, I fought the good fight and I finished the race. I kept the faith and there is reserved for me a crown of righteousness with the Lord, the righteous judge will give me on that day. And not only to me, but all those who have loved is appearing. And I believe Pastor Henry kept the faith he was able to, to, to breathe his last breath knowing that 
He left nothing on the table. That he didn't uh, yield to the easy way just because uh, everybody else around him. Uh, the years that I knew him, he had a lot of reasons to give up. They had a lot of reasons to say, throw in the towel and say, we've had enough. But you know, he chose none of those. He only chose Jesus as a reason to continue on. Yes. And I think as we remember, Pastor Henry, here today, I think it's fitting that we remember the endurance, as we're told even in Hebrews chapter 12, that we are to endure in this life, putting away the things that so easily beset us, the things that so easily pull us away from the focus that Jesus has for our lives. Mm. And that endurance, though Paul used it as an easy word, is a very hard word to live through the test of time. But yet we stand here right now to honor this man and to, and to be encouraged that it's possible because he did it and he finished. And the last word I have, and this I'm going to have to have you use your imaginations. Hopefully we're not too old to use our imaginations this morning or this afternoon. Hopefully it would take a step back in time and imagine that we're young, right? Uh, we can still be young. Uh, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, it talks about that we are surrounded by such a great crowd of witnesses. Mm -hmm. I know when I was talking to Miss Martha that uh, and we were standing there watching Henry and, and his uh, wanting to go home and ready to go home. And think about it this way. Many of us as preachers will stand and will say, well, to be absent in the body is to be present with the Lord. And we settle that and we make ourselves feel good. But I think heaven has a different aspect or a different, or a different outlook on it. Because in heaven, when somebody gets to a place like Pastor Henry is, they're setting up bleachers on each side. <laughs> and those bleachers are beginning to fill with the crowds of witnesses. And they cannot wait until he walks through the gates. Yes. Right. And when he gets through the gates, you think about how loud it would be in heaven. Even louder than it is when you watch the Polar Express and they have the first gift of Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, as he walks through the gates, I know that he got to the throne. And we know in Matthew 25 that it talks about that the whole goal of all that we have is that we hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant. You know that there was probably a hush over the crowd as he heard those words and then was handed the crown. That he, You know, it, there's many crowns it talks about in the Bible, but one is for a shepherd, and it's in 1 Peter chapter 5. And I just want to read this, and I'll leave you with this. 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 2 through 4. It said, Shepherd God's flock among you, not overseeing out of compulsion, but willingly as God would have you, not out of greed for money, but eagerly, not lording it over those entrusted to you, but it being examples of the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive an unfading crown of glory. You know, my wife and I were so privileged to be able to uh, take what Martha and Henry had, had given their lives to build and to carry that on for the time that we were to carry it on. And, you know, Though he retired as a pastor, I know you can retire is in the human form of the job that we are given, per se. But you don't get to retire from the callings that God placed on your life. Right. And he might not have stood behind the pulpit every day, but he still continued to pastor people. Mm -hmm. You cannot find anybody that went to visit him that he did not encourage and build up and strengthen their life. And that's why we're all here today. Mm -hmm. Because we were encouraged by the life that he lived. Right. And truly, I guess the last thing I have to say, it was a privilege to know a man of this caliber. Because as I go on in this life, there's very few that are willing to hold to the standard that he and his wife have held to. They're unyielding. They're unwilling to bow. They're unwilling even in the face of all that life would throw at them to lay down and say, I give up. Right. But they hold on to Jesus. Right. They hold on and they draw together and they draw close to him. Now, it'd be foolishness for me just to leave without this because I've about burned up my time. And God knows I could go on for a long time. Everybody just close your eyes for just a minute.
If you're here today and you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, or maybe you've known him and you've walked away, this is your day to come back. This is your day to come to Jesus. Pastor Henry's life was an open book to direct people to the cross and to the Savior. And it would be no encouragement for us to leave our time with him without giving you this opportunity. If that's you here this morning, I would encourage you, just slip your hand up and we're going to pray. Because as I spoke earlier, those who have this Jesus inside their life and he is Lord of their life, you have this hope that you will see Pastor Henry once again. But the truth is, if you do not, or you've walked away, you do not have this hope, this will be your last goodbye. But his life was a story so that you could get to a place to see him once again. If that's you, just slip your hand up and we'll pray. Thank you, Jesus. Well, I just want to pray over you all. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the privilege of being able to speak here today. Thank you so much for the Schick family and what they mean to your kingdom. God, your Bible has been written with the lives of people who are willing to lay it all on the line to do whatever it took to uphold the standard of Christ. God, today we celebrate yet one more of those people. Thank you so much for the privilege of knowing him. God, we thank you that each and every one of us here have been touched in some way. God, though he wasn't a perfect man, neither are we. Jesus, we don't focus on the imperfections today. We focus on the Jesus that he glorified in every part of his life. God, I just thank you for these people in Jesus' name. And I thank you for the life that we celebrate today. With that, before uh, I was asked to give one announcement, uh, it's not on your paper, so don't get thrown off. After you get done listening to the prelude, uh, everybody is invited back to Miss Martha's house for food and drink and uh, time of uh, fellowship and, and uh, all that that goes on with that. And she would appreciate your company, and I encourage you to make sure that you uh, put off everything else that you have to do to do that because tomorrow the invitation won't be open.
thank you that this is a day that you have made and we truly will rejoice and be glad in it. For, so, Father, I pray this morning that our hearts will not be troubled, but we will celebrate the life and the legacy of this mighty man of God who's now in your presence rejoicing and celebrating being with Jesus. And so, Father, we thank you that his living was not in vain as we look around and we see friends from near and far come to celebrate. And so, Father, you get the glory, the honor, and the praise. And now, Father, we lift up his family this morning, his wife of 60-something years of holy matrimony. Father, we pray that you would strengthen her on this day, God. Let her know that you're, you love her and that her she can lay her head on your bosom any day, Father, for you are loving, caring, sharing, Heavenly Father. And then, Father, we pray for his son and, and all of his brothers and sisters and nieces and nephews, the whole family, that you would comfort and strengthen them. And, and God, we thank you for this. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Amen. I'll be reading this morning two scriptures. The first one is in the Old Testament, Psalm 1. And it and it reads as following. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the seat of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of living waters, that bringeth forth his fruit and his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth, shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff, which the wind driveth away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. And then I'll read 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 51 through 57. And it says, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in the moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall all be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put away on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall we be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't it awesome? Where I like verse 57 where it says, But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Let me hear you say, I have the victory this morning. I have the victory. Amen. This is a celebration this morning. It's not a funeral where we come to mourn. We come to celebrate the life and the legacy of this mighty man of God who has impacted so many lives, not only in this city, but around the world, because every person that he touched here Probably a lot of them must have been military. They PCS somewhere, and this person told somebody about Jesus. So we're celebrating the life and the legacy of Pastor Henry this morning. So I believe if Pastor Henry were to say anything, he would say, lift your heads up this morning. Don't be discouraged, but be encouraged to know that I'm in the best place. And what is that best place, you ask? That's the presence of the Lord. That's where we all want to be. Amen. Amen. And I don't know about you, but that's where I want to be, in the presence of the Lord. And so now we have special music this morning by Miss Jamie um, on this morning near the cross.
There. Hello. I'm Pastor Gene Brown, I'm Pastor of Thousand Islands Christian Church, just up the road here. And uh, Martha has asked me to let you know that a couple things. Uh, one of them is their son Brian could not be here because he got everything ready and was ready to come to the airport. And on the way out, his wife fell down the stairs, broke her hip, her pelvis had to be rushed to the hospital. So he couldn't be here, but what he did is he made a short video tribute to his dad. And I want you to, can you dim the lights or whatever you got to do? And uh, we'll go ahead and watch that now. For my father. Most of you likely knew my father as a public figure, as teacher, administrator, counselor, or pastor. And he served these public roles through deep selflessness and unending dedication, even sacrificing his own health as part of his service. But in his heart, my father was the most private of people. His true devotion and his deepest motivations were both highly personal and deeply heartfelt. He sought to be a conduit and servant of the good and of God as he understood them. The German word connect, the root of our English word knight, and which translates to servant, rings truer than any other to my enduring memories of him as a man and as a father. He was gentle, kind, honest, loyal, and loving, but above all, he was a selfless servant. My earliest memories of my father are filled with warmth and love. As a young child, he was my friend, my advocate, and my mentor. He instilled in me early the importance of being a faithful servant. At bedtime, I always looked forward to one of his impromptu stories, which I dearly loved. These stories were often prefaced with his recurring admonition, son, always remember, be a good person, a good Christian, and a good citizen. And from my earliest years to the end of his days, I saw him live this out in his own life. Now, being a servant of the light meant rising above one's baser instincts. As I grew older, I grew increasingly aware of a shadow of embedded anger and violence within the culture and fabric of his own blue-collar, Depression-era childhood. He rarely talked about this directly, and it clearly caused him pain when he did. His own spirit was gentle and loving. He never passed on to my mother or me the pain he himself had experienced as a child, and he never once raised his hand in anger and ever counseled me to rise above these coarser instincts. As a husband, he worried endlessly about my mother's frail health and again did everything in his power to care for her. In an era in which family gender models were rigidly unyielding, my highly conservative father not only embraced all the standard male tasks around the house, but also most of the female ones. He cooked, cleaned, did the laundry, and much more as acts of service and love. To say that he went above and beyond in caring for our family would be an egregious understatement. He gave of himself until he simply had no more to give. Outside our home, he served as an educator, guidance counselor, and school administrator. His clear intelligence and his strength of conviction made him stand out and he rose rapidly in his early career. But I also saw his sensitive spirit suffer from the pettiness and power games that accompany human institutions. Here, as ever, his loyalty was to what was highest and best, and he cared little for position or privilege. He was a dedicated worker, but he could never be a yes man. Throughout my teen years especially, I watched him repeatedly and fearlessly call out powerful school board members, administrators, and fellow employees for decisions he saw as being made for mere personal gain rather than for the common good. Ultimately, I saw him sacrifice easy career advancement for the sake of his own ideals, and I never once saw him consider taking the path of mere convenience, no matter the cost. After retiring from education, he chose to continue serving, this time to his best understanding of God himself. And once again, his integrity and commitment shone brightly. When the church he was faithfully serving suddenly crumbled in the wake of deep corruption among its other leaders, he stepped up to lead the faithful and found a new congregation in this very building. Once again, 
I watched him perform this service with deep humility and utter devotion, setting aside my own concerns that this would harm his health out of his greater love and care for those around him. From this time forward, I saw him increasingly pay dearly for his ongoing self-sacrifice with his own health. Even as he himself saw this, he could not and would not back away from what he saw as his duty to God and to his fellow believers. Many times, I urged him to pass on the torch of leadership and take time to nurture himself and regain his own health. But as a faithful servant, he simply could not step aside until he felt led to do so. And until that time, his duty, as he understood it, was to continue to faithfully hold high the torch as a beacon to others, regardless of what it would cost him personally. No man is perfect, and my father was no exception. I dearly wish that he might have learned that the complement of service is self-care, and that even the noblest warrior must take time to heal and to breathe in the beauty of the present moment. As a child, I caught a few fleeting glimpses of his life as a younger man, enjoying golfing, camping, and close friends. But during my lifetime, I rarely saw him enjoy close relationships outside of work and almost never saw him take time for personal rejuvenation. His golf clubs and bowling bag collected decades of dust, while a lawnmower, tractor, and other tools of family and public duty were ever polished and in continuous use. But even here, he was driven by love and a faithfulness to duty. If he lacked the tools to show himself the care and love he so richly deserved, he never withheld his love from his family. In all my life, including those inevitable, difficult teenage and young adult years, I never once had reason to question my father's love or his kind and gentle heart. Even when we might disagree about issues, his underlying compassion, warmth, and care were never once in question. Not many children can say that, their fathers. I'm proud and grateful that I can. I carry with me memories of a man who ever remained true to his best understanding of what is true, loving, and noble in life, and of one who cared ceaselessly for his family and those around him. I am grateful and proud when I think of the life lived by my father, whose life served as a shining example of deep service and devotion to the highest good that was revealed to him. May you truly rest in peace, my dear father, and at long last rest and heal from your ceaseless labors of love in this life. For our part, we will remember your goodness, your devotion, and your selflessness. You will be deeply missed, but never forgotten. And our lives are richer, nobler, and finer because you touch them. Wow, how do you follow that? That was amazing. We are going to, this is the part of the service where we have a, a time of remembrance, and I know um, Fred's got some things to share, and some others have some things to share, so why don't you come on up and, and share that, Fred? What's that? Some of you know me from Liberty, where I met Pastor Henry and Ms. Martha. Um, I was actually going to wing it this morning, but because there's so much I can say about Pastor Henry, so I wrote it down. Actually, I wrote it down because I didn't know if I'd get through it. And my current pastor, Gene Brown, said he would finish it for me. <clears throat> trust to counsel you in any situation or circumstance with no judgment, only concern and love. Pastor Henry and Miss Martha became family, <clears throat> parent-like to us during marriage and family counseling, which got extended to meeting for coffee and fellowship and just enjoying each other's company. 
I enjoyed working on their home and sitting with Pastor Henry during a break and listening to the wisdom and knowledge of God's word he would speak to me. <clears throat> I remember one specific afternoon during lunch break, Pastor Henry's upstairs writing a Sunday sermon, and I went up to say hello to him, and I was there for an hour. He preached this whole sermon to me and asked me what my thoughts were. <clears throat> I'm a very private person when it comes to my personal life. And besides my father, Pastor Henry is one of two men, both of whom are pastors, who I respect and trust with every aspect of my life. I believe there's a great man whose words have a positive impact on another's life, especially to the point of bringing about a change in their life. <clears throat> Pastor Henry is a blessing, and my life and marriage are a testimony of his faithfulness to our Lord and his love for others. A life well lived, a life well lived is a precious gift indeed, and Henry lived well. A life full with hope, strength, and grace from someone who has made our world a brighter place. It's filled with moments sweet and sad, with smiles and sometimes tears with friendship formed and good times shared and laughter throughout the years. A life well lived is a legacy of joy and pride. A pleasure of living, lasting memories our grateful hearts will always treasure. I didn't know Principal Schick, and I didn't know Pastor Henry, and I did not know him as a counselor. I just knew Henry. I have no memories of sermons. I have no memories of lectures. I met him in the last year, the hardest year of his life. Henry and Martha told me that they believed that God had sent me to them. And I believe that God also sent them to me. For the better half of a year, I spent more time with them than I did my own family. And it was the greatest chore of love and service that anyone could ever experience. Henry, in the last year, was very selective in with whom he spoke and with whom he shared his life with. I prayed every day that God would give me the strength and the wisdom to care for him, for his beloved servant, that I could make every day as wonderful as it could be. Henry and I developed a bond that was so beautiful and so full that it could only be described as divine. Every day I was able to make him smile and I gave him all that I could. He asked me in the beginning to promise him that I would always be honest with him. And he made me promise that I would always look after his beautiful wife, Martha. I did this to the very best of my ability. And for the next eight to nine months, we became a family. Not a single night went by that we did not pray that we did not plan, that we did not laugh, that we did not cry as a family. He brought so much to my life. <coughs> he brought so much to my life as much as I ever brought to his. 
Henry and I spoke many times of death and dying and what his feelings were and what his fears were. I promised that I would be there with him until the very end. And God helped me to see that through. I had the distinct pleasure and the honor to be with him as he drew his last breath. I was there until the very end, and I held his hand as he said goodbye. Henry, you are my sunshine, and my only sunshine, and you will forever make me happy when the skies are gray. Thank you. <clears throat> Ms. Martha wanted me to let you know that she's doing this musical tribute, Jesus Loves Me and Because He Lives, and uh, wanted me to let you know that was Henry's favorite song, and she, he used to sing it to all the nurses and doctors in the hospital. <laughs> so...
Well, nobody told me that it was going to be my job to follow all of that. Um, I don't exactly know how I can follow all of that, except I know what God told me to share with you today. They tell me they don't have the ability to display scriptures on the screen here today. But I'm going to just share with you a couple things from my heart and just essentially one, one thing the Lord told me to share. By the way, Pastor Myron, thank you so much for your eloquent uh, introduction. Really appreciate you. Appreciate you opening the building here and, and uh, using this in this fashion. What a fitting tribute to a man of God. Amen. I appreciate uh, those who are here today. Who Some of you have traveled distance. Some of you are friends. Some of you are family. Some of you are um, parishioners, former parishioners. Maybe you even knew Pastor Henry when he wasn't Pastor Henry, when he was a school supervisor and, or counselor or whatever. Um, I don't really know how anyone could top what um, their own son Brian put in that video tribute. That was deeply moving and powerful. And uh, how can I add to that? I can't. But what I can tell you is, you know, it was a few years ago, we got to know Pastor Henry and Martha because our own daughter at the time had uh, was just in the process of leaving home and uh, was continuing her education here at JCC. And uh, she and a girlfriend moved into an apartment down here in Watertown, so that would be easier to do. And we were all in favor of that. It was time for her to fly the nest. Anyone know what I'm talking about? <laughs> and so one day, now she'd always been Pastor Jean's daughter in our church. And uh, so she said to me one day, she said, Dad, do you care if I didn't come to our church? If I, if I, and so I said, well, where do you want to go? And she said, well, I want to go to River of Life with Pastor Henry and Martha Schick. And I said, that would be great. And one of the things that you understand if you know anything about the ministry when you're children, I have a son and a daughter, Noah and Rebecca, and the problem is, is when they grow up in the church, they're always the PKs, they're always the pastor's kid. And so they have unrealistic expectations thrust upon them, or they imagine there's expectations thrust upon them. And we've had several conversations about that over the years. And so at our church, she was always going to be Pastor Jean's daughter. But when she came here, she was just Rebecca. And so that was when she actually began to grow in the Lord and actually began to bloom because Pastor Henry and Martha quickly kind of adopted her and kind of put her in, at, to work in the church doing different things. And that was, I'm, I'm deeply grateful for that because that helped to shape the woman that she is today. Today, she is a um, licensed nurse midwife and uh, is dealing with, you know, people at the at crisis pregnancies and all those different things uh, right now. And uh, her husband uh, got out of the military and took training as a professional firefighter and also a rescue diver and EMT and all these things. And so... They have two little children, Ruby and Rocket. And, uh, you know, I, I, I credit Pastor Henry and Martha for putting something into my daughter because even today she is leading others to the Lord. She is helping others. She's minister she actually works in a hospital where she, is, she can pray for people while she's ministering to them, to these ladies that are having difficulty in their birth and in their pregnancy and minister the word of God to them. And she's deeply involved with her church out there in Texas where she is. And I credit a lot of that to Pastor Henry and Martha. So thank you. And that's when we, we actually first got to know Henry and Martha more when my daughter, her potential husband came to us, you know, and said, we want to get married, we want to get married in the church. And, and uh, you know, of course, that's my little girl. And uh, I wasn't going to do the service. I was going to walk her down the aisle. 
in my own church. And she wanted Pastor Henry to perform the wedding, which I was relieved that he would do that. Because uh, I didn't know if I could get through walking her down the aisle, much less doing a wedding ceremony. And uh, I'm, a, I'm a crier, so that, you know, I was shed a lot of tears that day of joy. But Pastor Henry, I was always grateful to him and Martha for coming and performing that uh, wedding ceremony for my daughter. Appreciate that. And so when I got the call from Martha a few years ago saying, could you come and pray? You know, Pastor Henry's going through some life challenges, health challenges. And uh, I said, sure. And I came and we got a chance to talk. And, and uh, I think it was actually um, five years that, uh, uh, you know, they really thought he was going to die five years before he did. And the Lord rescued him and delivered him and he was able to come home. And after quite a, anyway, I won't, won't bore you with all the details, but in coming over to their house when Pastor Henry health was failing, um, you know, it was difficult to understand him. He would talk, but he was, he was, he was laboring to get out the words, and it, you kind of had to really listen to understand. And so I sat down with him, and you know, it took me by surprise when he said, I want you to do my funeral. And I said, what, what, you know, I mean, my response was, well, it would be a privilege. It would be an honor. But you know, when somebody who's looking at you saying, I want you to do my funeral, that's quite, it takes you back quite a bit. You know, I had to really ponder that and think about that. I agreed to it, but I, you know, that it's, it's not a light thing. And so today, here we all are. Obviously, we're in the land of the living, and he is also in the land of the living, but just not here. <laughs> and so, what do celebrations of life celebrate? And so I began to think about that whole subject. And most of the time when I think about those things, the Lord leads me to the Psalms. And so I went to Psalm 116. And it says it this way, I love the Lord because he's heard my voice and my supplications. The Lord's heard your voice, Martha. Heard your supplications. Heard Henry's voice. Heard his supp All of you who prayed. All of you who labored in prayer for Henry. The Lord heard you. Because he has inclined his ear to me, therefore I will call upon him as long as I live. Henry did that. The pains of death surrounded me and the pangs of Sheol laid hold of me. I found trouble and sorrow. But then I called upon the name of the Lord. Lord, I implore you, deliver my soul. God did that. I said God did that. Amen. Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Yes, our God is merciful. The Lord preserves the simple. Aren't you glad? Amen. I was brought low and he saved me. Return to your rest, O my soul, for the Lord has dealt bountifully with you. For you have delivered my soul from death, my eyes from tears, and my feet from falling. God's done all that for Henry. Delivered his soul from death, delivered his eyes from tears. He's in the land where there is no more sorrow. There is, there is no more pain. There is no more tears. He doesn't fall and stumble anymore. He can run and jump and leap for joy. If he wants to fall down before Jesus, he can. And he can get back up again too. He can speak. 
I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. He's in the land of the living right now. Did you hear me? He's in the land of the living right now. I believed, therefore I spoke. I am greatly afflicted. He was. I said in my haste, all men are liars. But then he goes on and says, what shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits towards me? Benefits are good things. Good things that God does. Amen? Amen. I will take up the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. And he knew where to turn in his time of need. Martha knows where to turn in her time of need. I will pay my vows to the Lord now in the presence of all his people. And then finally, verse 15. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his sins. Think about that for a moment. <coughs> Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. I happened to look it up in the Amplified Version and it says it this way. Precious and of great consequence in the sight of the Lord is the death of his godly ones so he watches over them. You think about that. All of heaven knew when Henry walked through the gates. I believe there were angels there greeting him. Welcome home, good and faithful servant. Well done. I don't know about you, but that's what I want to hear when I get to heaven. Huh? And the only way you do that is by being a servant. It's so simple. Just be a servant of the Lord. Do what he says. Follow his leading. I heard Brian say that over and over again. That because of his deep convictions, he kept doing what God wanted him to do instead of maybe what he wanted to do. You know, that is the mark of a servant. Even Danya said that. That's the mark of a servant. Someone who says, like Jesus, not my will, but yours be done. Someone who lives his life like that is a shining, shouting example of what a real believer is, what a real Christian is. And brings grace and glory to the name of Christ. You know, I've done a lot of funerals. And somebody said, there's more lies told at a funeral than any other time. <laughs> All of a sudden, this person who was a reprobate in life becomes a uh, saintly saint. But I will tell you with great confidence, just as Brian said, no man is perfect. We, we get that. But if you wanted an example of a godly man, take a look at Pastor Henry. Amen. Just like Fred said, what an example to follow. It's both humbling and motivating that people would say that about me now. And I'm glad to hear that now. It, and it, it motivates me to continue to walk with God. I'm sure that your encouragement to Henry during the, all these struggles that he's had encouraged him to continue to walk with God. I'm sure it's going to be encouraging to Martha in the days and the weeks and the months to come. It's like the guy who said, it's worth it to serve God. May not pay off every Friday. May not even pay off every month, but sooner or later, it pays to serve God. Amen. And then when this 
mortal coil is shuffled off and this body is laid to rest, you live forever in the joy of heaven. Forever and ever. Henry is in our future. This is a celebration of life, not a time of sorrow and mourning. Don't go out of here and say, we lost a great man of God. Say, heaven gained a saint, and we will be there soon to celebrate with him. Amen. 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 It's not that we say goodbye. It's that we say, so long for now. We'll see you soon. Amen. 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 The very next verse after precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints said, O oh Lord, truly, I am your servant. Henry truly was God's servant. I am your servant, the son of your maidservant. You have loosed my bonds. Henry's bonds are loose today. He's free. And so the psalmist says, I will offer to you the sacrifice of thanksgiving and will call upon the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord now in the presence of all his people in the courts of the Lord's house. In the midst of you, O Jerusalem, praise the Lord. What a great and powerful legacy Henry Schick left for all of us. If we could follow, you know, Paul made the statement, Paul, the beloved apostle, said, follow me as I follow Christ. We can all learn from that. And I believe Henry would say, if he were here today, he would say, follow me as I follow Christ. Let's pray. Father, I pray for those dear saints who are here today who know you, that they would follow you even closer and know you even deeper because of the legacy, the godly legacy of Henry Schick. I thank you, Lord, that we can take solace, encouragement, comfort, strength from his godly example of being a servant, a humble servant of yours. And we can gain from what he did. And Father, for those who may be here that don't know you or are backslid, that have wandered away like the prodigal son of old from Father's house, Lord, I pray that this would be the day they would return to Father's house. They would say yes to Jesus. And Lord, I thank you for that example of the father of the prodigal running to meet him and embrace him and welcome him back into his home. I thank you, Father, that your heart is towards those who mourn. You said precious in your sight is the death of your saints. And I thank you, Father, you, by the great Holy Spirit, wrap your big arms of comfort around each heart, around each life, and let them know you got this. You got this. Henry's okay. And as long as you follow me, you'll be okay. I got this. Thank you, Lord, for your grace and your mercy. Ask your blessing upon each one. And now in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, I pray a blessing upon each one today. I pray as we travel to the cemetery, Lord, you keep us safe. As we lay this body, this mortal body in the ground, Father, may you comfort each heart. I thank you for it. 
ask your blessing in the mighty name of Jesus. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. We will be following the folks here uh, to the Black River Cemetery. And uh, there will be a brief committal service there. And then we will be coming back here. You're all invited to come back here for a lunch. Okay? God bless you.
That's the only problem with that, Miss Martha. Now everybody knows how old you are. We're gathered here today to celebrate the life and mourn the death of Henry Ship. The eternal God is your refuge, and underneath are the everlasting arms. He will thrust out the enemy from before you and will say, destroy. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. At times like these, we're comforted by the memories of those whom we love. Though we are sad, we don't grieve as those who have no hope. We know that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. As 1 Thessalonians 4 says, For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. Henry's just fallen asleep in Jesus. Mm -hmm. And he woke up in heaven. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And I love this last part. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. 
Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if you know Jesus, not only has he gone to prepare and has a place prepared for Henry, he has a place for every one of you too. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Where I go you know and the way you know. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you're going, and how can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Henry knew these words. It wasn't just words to him. It was his life. He embraced the Lord Jesus, and the Lord Jesus Christ embraced him. Thank you, Lord, for a faithful brother, faithful father, faithful husband, faithful nephew, faithful brother, faithful son. Thank you, Lord. Because of his testimony in this life, now he has a testimony forever. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the faithfulness. We thank you for the commitment. We thank you for the consecrated life that's represented here. Lord, we know this is just the shell that we are placing in the ground. We know that the real Henry lives forever with you now. And Lord, we know in the name of Jesus Christ, whom he loved and served, we commit his body here to rest, knowing that his spirit is with the Lord in his heavenly home. In so doing, we rest our hearts in fresh confidence upon the sure and certain hope of the resurrection to life through Jesus Christ, whom, as you said, will transform it, uh, our lowly body that it may be conformed to his glorious body according to the working by which he's able even to subdue all things to himself. We gather in this solemn place to remember the life and mourn the death of Henry. We do not sorrow as those who have no hope, for our hope is in Jesus. We ask you, Lord, you would comfort each family member, each friend. May they, may they be comforted by your word, encouraged through happy memories, and sustained by the hope of the resurrection for all who place their faith in you. Amen. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. There is a reception back at the church, and everyone is welcome. You're welcome to pay your last respects. There are roses um, in the bucket on front. You're welcome to step in the casket, take a rose, and place it on the casket if you wish to.